So as we talked about with the nulls, they're essentially saying that like nothing is happening, right? So nothing's going on here, nothing to see here. What we're really looking for in our research, though, is what's referred to as the research hypothesis. It's also referred to as the alternative hypothesis. I hate that name. I think that's so confusing. But anyway, your textbook, I believe, refers to it as the alternative hypothesis. It basically means research hypothesis. And in this case, it's the position that something observable is happening, right? There's an observable or measurable um, relationship between X and Y, right? And in this case, for example, you might say, there's a significant difference between men and women's scores on IQ tests. In this case, you're stating that, yes, biological sex um, does seem to have a significant uh, or at least some impact on uh, an individual's uh, score on an IQ exam. Um, in this case, we're actually talking about a non-directional uh, research hypothesis, which we'll, we'll talk more about in a second. But this is a non-directional research hypothesis or non-directional alternative hypothesis. You're not necessarily saying that women are going to score higher or that men are going to score higher. You're simply saying that there's going to be a significant difference between the scores, right? So it's saying, yeah, there's a difference here, but you're not saying what kind of difference specifically, right? And the same thing that we saw in the last slide, in this case, the breath of dogs who eat expensive dog food is significantly better than that of dogs that eat cheap dog food. So what we're saying here is that expensive dog food has a significant impact on the breath of dogs um, in general, right? So we're stating that there is something going on here. The bottom one is, in fact, a um, uh, directional hypothesis. So the top one, this significant difference, this is just saying that something is happening, right? We don't know which direction it's going, but something is happening. The one below it with the dogs is saying that dogs' breath actually gets better, right? So it's positing that the breath will go up. The quality of the breath, the smell of the breath will go up, right? And this is a directional hypothesis because it's stating that the, the variable will move in a certain direction, right? Likewise, you could also say it makes their breath worse, right? So that would also be a directional hypothesis. But we'll talk more about that in the, the coming slides here. So non-directional research hypotheses. In this case, uh, we're just specifying that there is a relationship between X and Y, but it's not going any, in a specific direction. We don't know which direction it's going to go. Right. Um, and let me point out, by the way, too, we're not talking about causation in this. We're not saying that being male or female causes you to be smarter or eating cheap dog food causes you to have worse dog breath. Right. It's simply saying that they are related. Do not confuse this with causation. We'll talk more about that throughout the course. Right. But basically, we're saying that there's two different groups or two different variables, and there is an unspecified uh, relationship between the two. Right. The simple version is group A and group B are not equal. Um, they are moving. They are not going to be equivalent. Uh, I used to teach a class uh, at um, California Baptist University called BH383, which basically was stats. Um, and uh, what I would argue is there was a difference between my section of stats and a colleague of mine, very nice colleague of mine named Professor Doolin. Our classes were different, right? Not that my class was any better, not that my class was any worse or vice versa, but simply that they were different. And this is true because our teaching styles were different, right? This is a non-directional research hypothesis. Not better or worse, different, all right? Same thing below. There's a significant difference between the scores on test one and test two. In that same class, I found that students never scored close to each other on exam one and exam two. If they did well on exam one, they didn't do well on exam two. If they did well on exam two, they didn't do, uh, excuse me, they didn't do well on exam one, they did well on exam two. Right? They never scored the same score twice, basically. And um, this made students very nervous because I would tell them, I'm like, there's a significant difference between exam one and exam two in test scores. And they're like, do they go up? Do they go down? It varies. It actually depends a whole lot. So they were never equivalent. They were just always all over the place. So these are non-directional research hypotheses because I'm not saying something goes up or something goes down. I'm just saying that they will not be equal. Right? These, by the way, um, these hypotheses are good when you don't know, like when theory or, or, um, uh, or prior research doesn't indicate a clear direction. It's okay to say, I think they'll be different. I think there'll be a change or a difference. I just don't know what it's going to be, right? That's perfectly all right. By contrast, more specifically, we have also directional research hypotheses or directional alternative hypotheses. They're synonymous, right? In this case, what we're saying is, yes, there is a difference, but it's going to look like this. Right? Something is going to go up, something is going to go down, one thing's going to be better, one thing's going to be worse, whatever, whatever. That's the idea. Essentially, that group A is greater than group B, or group B is greater than uh, group A, um, or that essentially there's a difference between the two groups, um, that the variables make a difference in this case. The group being, uh, which group you're in makes a difference on how you're going to perform or score or whatever, right? So, 
For example, uh, the class I used to teach another class called BH250, which was incredibly boring. Oh, it's one of the most boring classes I've ever taught in my life. Anyway, I would argue that it, even if you don't like stats, that my stats class was significantly better than my BH250 class. I think that BH250 was called Fundamentals of Psychology, Fundamentals of Behavioral Science, right? Okay, terribly boring, terribly dry. I did everything I could with that material, and it just would not get more interesting. And you know it's going to be pretty boring if the professor's not even interested, because I get paid to be interested in this. And it was bad. It was real bad. Having a flashback at the moment. Anyway, um, so in this case, I'm hypothesizing that my, th the, my stats class would be significantly better, significantly more interesting than my fundamentals class. And that'll tell you just how boring fundamentals was if the stats class is significantly more interesting. Just throwing out there, all right? And then another one here too, all other classes at CBU are not as interesting as my BH383 class. And that was, that was hyperbolic, it, not true. There was plenty of classes that were much more interesting. But in this case, I'm positing a direction. I'm saying with my hypothesis that something will be better, something will be worse, something's going up, something's going down. I'm being more specific, okay? More direct, actually, if it helps you remember it. If you're being more direct, you are utilizing a directional research or al directional alternative hypothesis. Right? I'm, uh, I'm, in addition to pictures, I really like having like word associations, so maybe that helps you as well. So with differences, right? So directional hypotheses, of course, require a one-tailed test. Essentially, with a directional hypothesis, you're only looking in one direction, right? The right answer is going to come from this way, metaphorically speaking, right? You're saying, this is where the right answer is going to come from. If the right answer comes from over here, I don't care because that's not where I'm looking. If I'm right, it's going to be from this way, right? By contrast, the non-directional hypothesis is, I'm not sure where the right answer is going to come from. It could come from either side, right? And so what you're saying is, as long as the right answer comes from one of these two directions, I'm correct. I didn't know which way it was going to come from, so I'm ready for the answer in the other direction, right? So I use a two-tailed test because I'm examining both ends of the spectrum, not just one, right? I feel like a um, flight attendant, right? So you'll look to this side of the craft, you'll look to this side of the craft, Exits are here. Anyway, um, so um, some things to remember, too, is when I, we're doing a null hypothesis, a null hypothesis says basically, no, no, nothing is happening, right? Nothing to see here. Whereas research hypothesis says, yeah, actually, look at this. This is what's going to happen. This is what we think is going to happen. This is what we observed, right? When we talk about the null, we're essentially referring to the population. There is no difference in the IQ between men and women, right? And when we say men and women, we're not talking about the men and women in the study. We're talking about all men and women, right? We're talking about all dogs in their stinky breath. Whereas the research hypothesis says, in this study, we found that uh, biological sex had an impact on IQ, or we found in this study that the cost of the food had an outcome with regard to the dog's breath, right? We don't really test the nulls, actually. We test the research hypothesis. We're trying to establish if we were right with our research hypothesis, and if we weren't right with that, the null takes over, right? We can say, ah, uh, well, actually, no, the dog food didn't improve the dog's breath, so the null was true, right? We're testing the research hypothesis, not the null. And it just, I mean, this is, you don't really even know this, but if you're a completionist and you want to know everything about everything, technically, we've, the null is, is historically like Greek, written in Greek, research in Roman. You don't need to know that. It, let's move on, okay? So things that make a good hypothesis. For the love of God, a hypothesis is a declaration. It ends in a period, not a question mark, okay? Make sure that that's embedded in your brain. Hypotheses are statements, not questions, because it's answering the research question, right? Hypotheses are an answer to the research question, okay? I slowed down there because I want to be very clear. Apparently, if you repeat things three times, students are more likely to remember. I think I've repeated it twice. Hypotheses are a statement, not a question. There we go. What we're saying is we're actually trying to predict the future. It's positing an expected relationship. We haven't done the research yet, but this is what we think the research will show in the future when we conduct it, right? We're not looking back. We're not looking at the present. We're saying in the future, when the research is conducted, this is what we think we will see, an expected relationship, right? As I said, it needs to reflect theory. It also needs to be based on prior research. If there's a hundred studies that said that A and B are not equal, you probably don't want to hypothesis that, hypothesize excuse me, that A and B are equal. Why would you do that? If a hundred studies are saying no, 
why would you say yes? You have no foundation for that, right? It doesn't mean you can't test. It doesn't mean you can't assess those studies and, and do it again. But it would be kind of foolish to hypothesize yes when everyone else says no, right? Um, and I know this, you might be thinking, well, in life, yes, in life, research is different. If all signs point to no, you don't really want to say yes. You would need evidence in order to support a theory of yes or a hypothesis of yes. They need to be direct and to the point. Right? Uh, a lot of English teachers, for whatever reason, teach students that a longer sentence is a better sentence. Right? The longer your sentence is, the better and more, more highbrow it might seem, which I think is stupid. Um, hypotheses don't need to be that way. Get to the point. Right? I said, um, the, you know, uh, biological sex impacts people people's IQ, right? You could even simplify that and say women are smarter than men. Done. Hypothesis, right? Keep it direct. Don't make it this really convoluted, oh, 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 let me add this in here too. Only hypothesize one thing at a time. There's nothing wrong with a research study having multiple hypotheses. So don't say that, you know, for example, women are smarter and stronger than men because essentially you have two different things you're measuring. Say women are stronger than men, hypothesis one. Women are smarter than men, hypothesis two. Okay, separate them. Do not have two hypotheses in the same statement. Okay, and as I said, I know I'm being redundant with this because we saw it previously in this lecture. Testable and falsifiable. You cannot cannot present a hypothesis that cannot be both tested and potentially falsified. All right. Notice it says falsified and not validated. We're not here to validate anything. This is a fundamental component of what we're talking about here. And if you think back to chapter one, I already mentioned this. We're not trying to prove anything. I don't put out a hypothesis and then conduct research to prove my hypothesis, right? I conduct research to find evidence to potentially support my hypothesis or refute it, falsify it, right? I'm not trying to prove anything. Make sure you kind of keep that in your mindset is that when we're doing research, research is very much like faith, right? You might see things around you that supports your faith. The birth of my children, the love of my wife, the love of my parents, right? The gloriousness of nature. I'm looking out my window right now. I've got a really good view of all these gorgeous trees. Um, all of these things support my faith, right? They are an evidence of God's majesty and benevolence that support my faith, right? I'm not looking for proof. I'm not looking for proof. That tree doesn't prove it. The love of my family doesn't prove it. It supports it, right? And you might think, ah, well, no, everything is proof of God's existence or God's love. Sure, you can see it that way, but faith is believing in the absence of proof, right? Research is believing in the absence of proof, right? We're not trying to prove anything. We're simply trying to build our scientific faith. <laughs>